Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Oklahoma Gardening. I'm your host, Steve Owens. On today's program, we've come over to Muskogee in eastern Oklahoma to take a look at the ice storm damage that happened back in January. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of OSU Extension as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. On January 13th here in Oklahoma, we had a pretty severe winter storm. There were parts of the state that didn't get much precipitation. There were other parts of the state that got a lot of sleet, like in Stillwater. We got around two inches of sleet packed on the ground. Now in the eastern part of the state and down in the southeastern part of Oklahoma, those folks got rain. But there was a certain swath from about McAllister up through Miami and on up into Missouri where they actually got freezing rain and this was pretty devastating to a lot of the trees because that freezing rain would freeze on the limbs and they would start to break. Well one city in eastern Oklahoma that got hit particularly hard was Muskogee and here to tell us a little bit about the ice damage to the trees in Muskogee is city urban forester Carrie Abner. Hey Carrie. Hi welcome to Muskogee Steve. Thanks for having us. So Carrie what happened uh, here in Muskogee with the ice storm? Well, on January 12th, we were watching the weather pretty seriously here in town, hoping that the, the meteorologists were incorrect in their assessment of the freezing rain. Sure. However, on the 13th, around noon, my crew was called in because we had already been getting some freezing rain. My crew had been called in to start helping clear roadways of debris because emergency vehicles were going to have a really tough time getting through. And those limbs were just falling the, over the limbs, into the streets and hanging. And yes, the limbs were um, from the weight of the ice and we had only had round one. The, the weight of the ice was already becoming too heavy for a lot of the vegetation. So um, they came in that day and were starting to clear. As the storm went on for three days, we had like three to four rounds, according to where you were, of, of freezing rain. There was an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters of ice on everything in Muskogee. Oh, goodness. And it, it was devastating to our trees. Um, my crew and the parks crews and all the city crews actually were out trying to just clear the roadway of debris so that emergency vehicles would have access to get to and from homes sure. if, if necessary. And then, um, as, as that started to subside, we started to take assess the actual damage within our own community, our public trees and, uh. and throughout the neighborhoods. And what we saw was devastating because not many trees within the city were left unscathed. Almost, Almost every tree had damage. I can imagine. And how, how would you categorize the, the amount of damage? I mean, is there, is there a number, I mean, for the amount of uh, just the, uh, the amount of wood that was, that was removed or still being removed? Well, right now the um, contractors are on their last pass through town picking up any debris that's on the curb. But um, our last estimate was almost 300,000 cubic yards of woody debris. Wow. And that's equivalent to like a category three hurricane. Wow. And other than just having a lot of, dis you know, buildings and construction damage and, and, and that sort of thing that's being hauled off. Ours was all tree. It was all tree related. Wow. So that's... it was very devastating. Okay. Our landscape has much changed. Okay, <laughs> I, I can imagine. So what, what's going on now? You've got crews working back here cleaning up the trees? Right. I have a, my, my, the parks crews were in Spalding Park, which is in a, a historic park here in Muskogee. Okay. And um, my crew is working out here and Weeby Trees out of Tulsa, Tim Nall is here to, to help us try to uh, help some of our larger trees recover from 
the ice damage. Uh, FEMA crews were in and they did some of the work for hangers and, and, sure. and that sort of thing, debris removal, but we're still left with some aftermath and we'll have to be monitoring these trees for a long time just to, because there are some damages that we aren't going to be able to see until sure. later down the line. So uh, Tim is here to help us try to help our, our larger oak trees in this park uh, make it through the, the onslaught of ice and the onslaught of contractors and then get us back into spring in Muskogee. All right, those azaleas blooming and everything like that. Yes. The, uh, uh, one of the things I guess we, we have to think about with the trees is where those limbs break and they split, they, they leave those really big wounds and a lot of the cleanup right now that is kind of reducing the size of those wounds. It's uh, actually making the, the wound to the branch collar which is okay. the healthiest place for you to prune a tree. Um, not just taking, you know, like dehorning a tree that is not proper, but taking it to the branch collar is actually the best, the best avenue. Because if you leave the jagged branches in there, that just opens that area up for pests and disease and that sort of thing to take hold, and then your tree starts to decline slowly afterwards. Okay. Well, the, uh, the folks that live here in Muskogee, what can they do at this time? to uh, uh, help clean up some of this, this, this problem? Are there, is, is there a little bit of uh, uh, assistance? Are the, the city crew still picking up some of those limbs? Uh, where, where, what should those folks do that still have broken tree limbs here in Muskogee? Well, city crews are taking care of as much of that as they possibly can. Um, like I said, they're making their last, they being the contractors, are making their last pass through town, trying to get all of the woody debris off the curbside. But we still have people in need of um, tree work because uh, the, the public trees, it, that's where our domain is, sure. the city crews. We're, sure. we're in charge of park trees, right-of-way trees, city, you know, all public domain. But um, the private trees, those folks, if they can't do it themselves, which um, if it's a very large tree, I don't suggest that. They don't that. need to be up but there. No, yeah. no, it's, it's really dangerous. They need to um, contact a lot of our local arborists that okay. are and they're available in the yellow pages okay all right well if uh, you're interested in finding out a little bit more information in in other parts of the state about uh, what to do about your trees that are uh, damaged from this recent ice storm uh, just stay tuned we're going to go speak with uh, mark bays our state urban forestry coordinator <laughs> Mark, here we are in Honor Heights Park in Muskogee, and the park looks a lot different now after the uh, the ice storm. We got all this this tree damage everywhere, and I was wondering if you could tell me what what exactly does this mean to the tree in terms of damage when when the tree does have a lot of limbs just stripped away. Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen a whole lot of ice damage throughout much of Oklahoma this past winter, and it's really appropriate to be talking about that sort of thing right now because much of the damage that we've seen with the ice storm is very similar to damage that we're going to be seeing with the tornado season coming in and straight line winds and everything and whenever any kind of event like that happens whether it's ice whether it's wind uh, what you usually see in trees is that they just get blown apart I mean they just get stressed out and so the the branches are essentially just ripped right off the tree and so you have jagged branches up in the tree and a lot of times they're just hanging there uh, and all through the park here, uh, Muskogee has done a really wonderful job in helping clean some of that up, but uh, you even kind of get a sense that there's still a whole lot more of that out there. Uh, and it's just it's tragic uh, when you lose that much of a, you know, your urban forest uh, in just one event that comes through. Some of the problems that are associated with that are that the, those jagged cuts uh, really open up the tree to a whole host of other problems that may come a little bit later. You have internal decay that may happen you have uh, uh, insect problems that may move into that tree. And so, uh, you know, so that's the thing that we're gonna be dealing with for quite some time. I mean, the ice storm is only here for just a week or so, but the, the problems that are associated with that come secondary, uh, we're gonna come from years uh, down the road. So it'll, it'll take a while for the, these trees to recover. Yeah, and, and any kind of event like that where you don't have just a natural delimbing process through you know, proper pruning, 
uh, the trees are going to, they're, they're just going to have a whole host of problems for a number of years. And the thing that's uh, going to be important for people to realize is that we, we may be rehabilitating these trees for quite some time. It's much like you go through major surgery. You know, uh, I had knee surgery a while ago, and, and you better bet I wasn't up the next day just running around. Uh, but it took me some, a while to recover from that. And so, so that's what we're encouraging people to, to do is to be patient, okay. uh, to, to realize that uh, you just can't come through in one time if your tree had major damage and make a quick fix because that's, that's just is not going to happen. I, I know sometimes people might think, uh, well, once I get the limbs all cut and cleaned up and all those, those, those proper cuts and everything, they, they want to fertilize a tree to get it to grow again. What, what do you think about that? Well, that's, that's kind of one of those uh, things that you might at first thought think is a good idea. I mean, let's feed the tree, let's give it some things. But the problem with that is, is usually when you push fertilizer into a tree, it stimulates top growth. Uh, you know, it's the stuff that gets the green leaves growing and everything. The tree has already been damaged and, and experiencing all sorts of stress uh, in that condition. Well, if you have a new flush of green growth come out all of a sudden, there's a lot of hidden things that we don't really know about. And so there may be some uh, stress cracks that are still left up in the tree that we won't see for a number of years. So if you have those stress cracks, those small cracks that you can't really see right now, then you add a bunch of weight on that, well, you're just going to create another hazardous situation. So, so really, I, I like to take a little bit more of a conservative approach to it. To uh, you know, to kind of get the tree back in balance. Because what happens when you lose all the upper portion of the tree, you lose the leaves, and so you lose the food production from that tree. Yeah. And, and now uh, there's so much root activity that could be lost as well because there's not as much food production going on. And so the tree is gonna take a few years to balance out. So you just really wanna be conservative with that. During uh, stressful times, probably the most aggressive thing I think you could do would be to just water the tree. I mean, just simply watering the tree and keeping the tree's uh, roots healthy uh, would, would be probably one of the better things that you can do over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then kind of watch to see how your tree uh, reacts to that. Now, if the, you start getting some root dieback, you, of course, won't be able to notice that. But uh, So just watch the top part of the tree. And, and see what happens because you'll probably see that some of the trees, even though you prune out a lot of those dead, uh, there may be still uh, other portions of the tree that uh, will die out in a couple of years. Okay. And to, uh, to folks who have a lot of damaged trees on their property, and you know, a, a lot of these, these, these limbs and the trees here in Muskogee, they're, they're, they're so high up. I mean, they're just way up at the top of these huge trees, and the average homeowner is not going to be able to take care of that. So, what's, what, uh, what do they need to do? Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're not standing underneath some of those trees that we're, we're picked a good place to stand. Yeah. But yeah, you can look up here and just see some of those large hanging branches that most homeowners can't get up and, and do anything to. So that's why we're, we're strongly advising you to work with uh, reputable tree care companies. And a reputable tree care company is one that is usually certified by an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to have the community, you know, if, if you're interested in having tree care done, call down to your uh, code enforcement in your city and town and see if they don't have a licensing requirement uh, for an operator to be doing that kind of work in your city. Unfortunately, we, don't, we do not have a statewide licensing requirement, but I know a lot of communities take that on locally, and so call locally to see if there's a licensing requirement. Uh, the other thing that you would need to make sure you check on to see if they're insured I mean, you're having these people come onto your property, and uh, they're doing dangerous work. Over, so make, over your roof. Over your roof, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. So, so, so make sure that uh, uh, that they're insured, and and that reputable companies will uh, provide you with that kind of insurance. Take it a step further. Call that insurance company to make sure that that uh, policy is still active. I mean, it's pretty easy, you know, just to get a policy or even to duplicate, uh, you know, a policy from the past and change the dates on it. And, and, you know, you can just be carrying around a piece of paper. That doesn't prove anything. So follow that up with sure. that sort of thing. There, there's a, a statewide organization right now that is promoting professional tree care uh, called the Oklahoma Arborist Association. And, and they are doing a really good job of uh, uh, educating a lot of the people in the tree care uh, industry in Oklahoma just on all the latest research that supports proper pruning techniques. They're doing a lot of education and um, you know training some of the folks that uh, may, may not have a formal education in forestry, horticulture, or, or, or arbor culture. And so uh, statewide, it, uh, we're seeing that uh, you know overall the tree care is beginning to improve. Great. The, one of the problems when this kind of an event comes through though is we get a whole host of other tree care companies from 
not from Oklahoma. So they're <laughs> they're fly by night and <laughs> yeah, some of these out of the woodwork, so to speak. Yeah, they just companies. they come in and they capitalize on other folks' uh, tragedy, and yeah. uh, you know these are the folks that uh, are doing questionable tree work in Oklahoma, and that's what we're trying to get away from. Sure. Uh, what, some, what do folks need to watch out for in, the, in that situation? Watch out for the the the, the hey the I'll, I'll give you the neighborhood discount kind of kind of uh, thing, okay. you know. And so if 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 you have a you know a reputable tree care company is they're they're busy all the time and so they don't need to go looking for business they don't need to yeah. and you know and and there's no such thing as hey I'm in the neighbor you know discount uh, mm -hmm. with them you know they're, they're and sometimes you know when when I get pitched that uh, I really question whether the, you know the real ethics of, of uh, that company uh, you know a reputable tree care company there's a good chance that you may have to spend just a little bit more money and you sure. might have to wait just a little bit. Sure. I'm saying be patient. I mean, don't be talked into doing something so quickly that, uh, you know, uh, if you feel any kind of pressure, I would just steer away from that. Uh, again, you know, the, the, it, it may cost a little bit more money uh, because to do it correctly is, is uh, it takes a little bit of extra time and it takes a little bit of know-how to do that. And, but sometimes it's well worth the wait. Uh, okay. I've heard stories time and time and again, and particularly this year, these people are getting these phone calls, they're being talked into, you know, my tree is hazardous, it's going to fall on my house the next day, and, and usually that's not necessarily the case, and we're just saying be patient with that. Okay. All right. Well, one uh, method of uh, pruning trees the wrong way is called dehorning, and uh, we're going to go take a look at uh, some, some places that uh, the trees have been treated in this way, unfortunately. Some, something that we, we never like to see, uh, absolutely. So. Okay. All right. Well, Mark, one of the worst things that uh, can be done to trees is a practice known as dehorning, or just chopping off a lot of the top of the tree. And I can see that uh, in the background here, there's some, some huge oaks that have had that done. They look awful, and what, why is this such a bad practice? Yeah, unfortunately, whenever we have an ice storm or problem come into a community like this, this is the work of the questionable folks that we were talking about just a little bit earlier. Uh, and it is a terrible thing that you can do uh, to a tree. You're essentially re removing all of the life support for the tree. You, we hear fertilizer being weed and feed. Well, that's really not necessarily the case because all the food production for trees goes on in the leaves of the tree through photosynthesis. And so essentially what you've done is you've cut off that food source for the tree. And so now it has to live off of the reserves uh, that it may have stored up over the winter and everything. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, some of the other things that uh, are happening here is that uh, you've opened up that tree to uh, a, a whole host of other problems, and some of those being internal decay. The problem with those cuts on the tree just arbitrarily being uh, done at random locations throughout the tree is that uh, it doesn't understand that it's been um, uh, pruned on, and so it will never seal over. And that's how insects can get into the tree through those open wounds. That's how decay problems can happen. Uh, I, I've seen situations where a tree that has been severely topped uh, 20 feet out from the main trunk of the tree, that decay moved 20 feet through that branch and turned down the main trunk of the tree. We saw this as, at an intersection in Tulsa a number of years ago, and it's just amazing to think that decay could move through that the far. tree uh, that far, and then structurally it becomes a big problem. Okay, and uh, another thing that happens, like after this is done, you get a lot of sort of suckering branches from those, those, those cut areas, and I, I know a lot of people think, well, gosh, look at all that growth on the tree, but there are problems with that as well. Yeah, I've heard that ex uh, explained by one uh, questionable person doing pruning. I questioned him. I said, why, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I'm trying to rejuvenate this tree. I'm trying to bring it back. And, uh, you know, so at first glance, that's what you see. You see a flush of new growth. Um, you know, we're, we call that suckering because the tree realizes that it has to replace all those leaves. And so it has to replace all that food source for the tree. And so it sends up these suckers off the tips of the branches just to try and replace that. Now, the problem with that is those those sucker points, those little water sprouts, whatever you want to call them, they are not part of the main uh, part of the tree anymore. Uh, the fibrous system that makes sure. the whole branch of a tree, so, so they're very weakly attached right at that point. And so there's a greater likelihood that sometime down the road now that that is going to become a hazardous branch that's going to come crashing down. 
Okay. And some of those 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 suckers, those those new branches that come off at those points, even when they're pretty good size around, you can you can almost just break those off with your hand. Oh, it's amazing just just how brittle they really are. You could just walk up to those kinds of situations and they'll just snap right off and and again, when they're small, they're not necessarily a problem, but later on, as they uh, get larger, then it's, uh, then it's gonna be a, a huge problem. And you know, it's just something that we just never like to see, particularly around your home where your children are playing in a yard, any place like that. Okay, so it just, just makes the tree weaker and more susceptible to storm damage. Absolutely, and, yeah. It's just something that we really yeah. just don't wanna see. So, so, so don't have your trees cut in this way. Never. Mark, we've talked to folks about looking at tree care professionals and uh, what to uh, think about when hiring someone to clean up some of the damaged trees right. on their property, but some homeowners might like to try to do some of the work themselves. Right. So what, uh, what do we need to think about when it comes to making cuts on a tree? Right, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know the, the tree care professional, it's gonna take them a little longer because uh, you know they're gonna do what we call target pruning, and that's what the homeowner needs to do as well. There's specific locations on each branch that you have to look for before you make those pruning cuts. And the reason for that is if you make an improper pruning cut, what's gonna happen is uh, that tree is gonna be open to all those problems we were talking about. So there's just a few places on a tree that I'd like to share with you that uh, the homeowners can learn from. Uh, and then all branches are, are set up the very same way. So just let's take a look at this tree here because okay. the great thing about this tree is that there's just so much going on. Uh, it's been pruned for quite some time on and off so there's some really good examples and there's some marginal examples so right. that's why i like uh, this particular uh, tree here good specimen yeah and in, in in all cases whenever you're doing pruning some of the things the very first thing you need to look at is what we call the branch bark ridge and it's the place the union on that trunk where the lateral branch comes in contact with the bark of the main trunk of the tree. So that's this area right here. You can kind of get a sense there where these, the bark from the branch and the bark from the main trunk of the tree are kind of coming together there. That's called the branch bark ridge. You never ever want to cut into the branch bark ridge because then that becomes more of a flush cut. And a flush cut is a terrible thing to do for a tree because you're opening up such a large wound. It takes longer for it to seal. That's correct. It takes just a long, long time. It also gets behind the natural sealing mechanisms for that tree. There's the other portion of, the, of that union that's called the branch bark ridge. And that's this union right here where you have a swelling of tissue before you come to the, uh, the main branch here that's pretty symmetrical as you can kind of look out here. You see that it's pretty symmetrical as it's going out. So there's a swelling area. And that swelling area is what's called the branch collar. And that's the area of the branch that the cells are most actively dividing. And what you want to do is you make your pruning cut just on the outside of that branch collar in a place right down in through here. And then you're on the outside of the branch collar, so then that branch will seal over uh, much quicker than any other place on the branch. Now if you leave it out as a stub here, the problem with that is, is that's bad because those dividing or those those cells are not going to realize that the branch is gone and so they'll never close off and it's it's just like topping a tree but it doesn't look as bad because you're so close to the trunk of the tree okay. now on a branch this large uh, we would go through the three cut process because what you don't want to happen if you just came in on a branch this large and make this cut here that's going to come and strip down and create a whole opening here and it's just going to be a big problem for the tree because it's such a big and heavy limb and it's just going to strip yeah. right down and, and i've just seen lots of problems with that so there's a three cut method that we use on that what you do is you come a little bit out from the main trunk of the tree you come up from underneath the tree about a quarter of the way up uh, and make your undercut and then you come on just the outside of that on the part here and make your overcut come down and it'll snap and fall off and then it won't strip down down okay. through here now those are the two cuts the third cut then you would come back here since there's not very much weight you'd make that cut right on the outside of that branch collar and then you'll have that small wound that's going to hopefully close over pretty quickly all right a good final cut yeah and we've got some other examples on this tree where uh, those, those cuts have been made in the past yeah that's, that's what's really so neat about this tree we really have some great examples of some uh, branches that have been previously pruned that uh, have been done so correctly. 
because what you have is you have that initial donut starting to form over there and that callus is very symmetrical all the way around. Uh, then also you have that callusing to where the, the wound is almost completely closed and that's a good sign. And then you have signs on the tree where it's just completely closed and the tree is just uh, moving on quite well. Okay, perfectly sealed over. And again, just that's making right. that cut in the right place uh, makes all the difference in, in how quick that's going to seal over. Right. And right up here, we've got a, a, a fresh cut that's, that's almost, that's where, almost where it needs to be. It's just not quite to the where the branch bark ridge. They could have gotten it just a little bit closer. On the other side of the tree here, I think you have a better example of what we're looking at because okay. they, made, they hit that target exactly where they needed to. They haven't cut into the branch bark ridge. They're right on the branch collar at a perfect location, so that should seal over quite nicely. Okay, that's what we're going for. Well, Mark, where are some uh, places that the public can get information on uh, taking care of the trees? Well, you could go to your county extension offices. You can contact us at the Department of Agriculture Forestry Division. You could call us. You could visit our website, and we have just a an abundance of information to, to send out to the folks that need to know. Okay, great. And the good news is, Mark, these, these trees will recover. Uh, Arnold Heights Park and the city of Muskogee and this, this area of the state that got hammered by the ice, uh, the trees are gonna go back. Absolutely, nature's been recovering from these tragedies for quite some time. And, and the great news is, is that, uh, you know, they, they will come through regardless of uh, what happens. And, and that's, we saw a lot of that with some of the redbud trees that are surviving no matter how hard they've been hit. Flowering and uh, just keeping that resiliency going even though they've been uh, broken by the ice. That's right. Okay, thanks, Mark. You bet. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on Oklahoma Gardening. We'll see you again next week. You may obtain more information, show notes, plant lists, and fact sheets by visiting our website at www.oklahomagardening.okstate.edu or by contacting your local OSU Extension office. Copies of this Oklahoma Gardening are available on DVD at a cost of $15 per episode. We would like to thank our underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support provided by the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. <laughs>